I love working in our yard. Uh, it's easy for me to come up with a long list of things to do on our property. Planting new grass, installing underground downspouts, new flower beds, the list can go on and on. Uh, one of the challenges for me is figuring out where am I going to start this project? Uh, the timing does matter in some cases. Of course, you don't want to put in new grass. Uh, you don't want to put grass seed down in the middle of July. Uh, wait till a little bit later in the fall. But, but in many cases, it's just a matter of getting started and going at it. Uh, this summer, I decided that I'd plant some new grass on our side yard. Uh, the process involved killing off the, the old grass and weeds and whatever was living there, then tilling the soils to start to get it even. And, uh, but then, uh, uh, while it's tilled up, it makes sense to put in the downspouts, and I'll, I'll need to get some more dirt to, to make sure there's a good grade away from the house, and the project just keeps building. That's how it goes for me. I don't know what it looks like for you on things like that. And right now, our, our yard is kind of a, a mess. <laughs> There's a, a big hole where the downspout is halfway done, and, and it is all dirt waiting for the right time to put in the seed, and, and there's nothing looking good there at all, really. But, but I have a picture of what it will be like in the future, and it's going to be lovely. I, I am sure that it will be. But the truth is, I, I can't get it all done at once. And if I have a picture about where it might be, and I'm right here right now, what's not going to happen is, is making that jump in one step. But what is hopefully going to happen is one thing at a time, bit by bit, uh, piece by piece, and, and one day that, that will look like the vision that I have in my mind. I don't know if you have similar projects in your own life where you have a picture about what it might be, and you look at where you are and you realize, well, I'm not there yet, but, but I need to keep moving in that direction. And I think that that journey is a little bit like our faith journey when we work toward justice. Imagine our community, uh, Topeka and Shawnee County, and imagine a picture of what it might be in the future and where it is today. Th there may be a long road from where we think life might be like and where we are today, a place where everyone has enough food to eat, a place where everyone has a place to sleep, where violence is decreased and maybe even disappears. That's not where we are today. And we're not going to get from here to there in one step, but the way that we will get there is step by step working together. Small, steady steps all mean progress when we consider working for justice, and it all creates an opportunity for us to live in joy. Today we conclude our sermon series in which I have been suggesting that one of the ways that we can find joy in our life, not just temporary fleeting joy, but long-lasting contentment, is by joining God's work for justice in our communities and acting for it. We don't often think about joy and justice together, yet we can find joy by putting our faith in action, pursuing justice, standing up for those that are oppressed. During these weeks, we've been seeking to discover justice and joy in our daily lives. Two weeks ago, you remember that we learned that biblical justice, uh, this, this justice that is shaped by the scriptures and our faith, one aspect of that involves caring for the vulnerable. Our faith invites us to speak up for and to act to help groups of people that have no social power for whatever reason. God gives us the freedom and ability to work for justice in our daily lives, and our faith involves praise and worship like we're gathered here today, and it involves working in our community on behalf of others. Last week, we considered two different ways of understanding justice. A part of justice means correcting justice. It means punishing wrongdoers and caring for the victims of those who've been treated unjustly. But working for justice also involves the work of primary justice, which means living in such a way that correcting justice wouldn't be necessary. It involves right relationships with God and with other people. This week, we consider how justice reflects the character of God, who God is, and it includes generosity. The scriptures help us find a source of strength to keep acting for justice and reminds us to find the power to take small actions to work towards the vision that we have for our community, to work towards God's kingdom coming right here in Topeka as it is in heaven, as we pray for every week. So what is justice? Our family and experiences and our cultures all help shape our understanding of, of what we 
say, mean when we say that word. So oftentimes, it's divided between social justice, what we talk about in faith and, and psychology or philosophy, perhaps, and, and procedural justice, which we think about uh, the, the justice system uh, in the study and application of the law. Uh, our focus here uh, in these weeks has been on how do we understand justice as it relates to our faith? How do we look to the scriptures and find a description there about how we might live our lives? In his book, Generous Justice, Tim Keller helps us understand that one aspect of biblical justice is that it reflects the character of God. This is who God is, a part of who God is. You might ask yourself, well, why should I be concerned for those who are vulnerable? And one's answer is because God is concerned about those who are vulnerable. Many times throughout Scripture, we find God introduced as a defender of vulnerable groups. One example is from Psalm 68, verses 4 and 5, where it says this, Sing to God, sing praises to His name. Exult the one who rides the clouds. The Lord is His name. Celebrate before Him. Father of orphans and defender of widows is God in His holy habitation. Do you see what happens in the Scripture? Father of orphans and defender of widows is who God is. This is in the introduction and in, in helping explain who God is in this particular context. And don't miss the significance of this way of introducing God. Uh, imagine the way that you introduce yourself to others. Uh, oftentimes, uh, when I'm introducing myself to others, uh, uh, what I say is, uh, I'm, I'm Andrew Connard. I'm the preacher at Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. Or or I might say, my name is Andrew, I'm married to Nicole. Or I might say, uh, my name is Andrew, John and Anne are my children, depending on the setting. Uh, Of course, I'm many other things, but these are some of the main ways that I identify myself. Uh, Part of my role here, uh, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my children, these shape who I am and the way that I interact in the world. And so when I identify myself with others, I'll often give them context. This is who I am. This is a part of me. And so when we see God introduced in this way, we know that it says something significant about God. It's significant that the biblical writers introduce God as father of orphans and defender of widows. This is one of the main ways that God is active in our world. One of the main ways that God invites us to join God in God's work, being a part of this action for justice. God identifies with those who are powerless and takes up their cause. And we are invited to identify with the powerless and take up their cause. I also want to suggest to you that work for equality uh, includes generosity. Sometimes people believe that fairness in society is strictly the punishment of wrongdoing, and and that's kind of the end of things. You may find yourself in that place, and and it doesn't mean that that we think that faithful people shouldn't care about the situations of the poor, but but maybe you've uh, heard people insist that, that helping the needy through generous giving should be called mercy or compassion or charity. And and not justice, maybe separating the two. Of course, in in English, the word charity conveys something that's good, but something that's optional. An act of charity cannot be a requirement for then, it would not be charity. But this understanding doesn't fit with biblical teaching when it comes to justice. In the scriptures, giving to the poor is a way of practicing our faith. We see in Matthew 6, 1 and 2, be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention, Jesus says. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so they may get praise from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. Jesus is describing our life of faith. He says, whenever you give to the poor, it doesn't say, give us an option. It's an assuming that we do this. Verse 1 in the New International Version reads like this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will receive no reward from your Father in heaven. Practicing your religion, living out our faith, living out our righteousness, the way that we are active in the world. Not giving generously, then, is not stinginess, but unrighteousness, a violation of God's invitation for living for us. In the book of Job, we see Job call a failure to help the poor as an offense 
to the splendor of God, to the glory of God. Hear these words from Job 31. If I have denied what the poor wanted, made a widow's eyes tired, eaten my morsel alone, meaning keeping all my food and my resources to myself, and not shared any with an orphan, for from my youth I raised the orphan as a father, and from my mother's womb I led the widow. May my arm fall from my shoulder, my forearm be broken at the elbow, for God's calamity is terror to me. I couldn't endure his splendor. Job says, listen, if I don't do these things, I'm not willing or able to stand in front of God. Job is asserting that it would be a sin against God to consider his resources as goods belonging just to himself. To not share his assets with the poor would be unrighteous, a sin against God, and therefore, by definition, a violation of God's justice. Despite the effort to draw a line between justice on one hand as legal fairness and sharing as charity on the other, numerous scripture passages make radical generosity one of the marks of living justly. The just person lives a life of honesty, equity, and kindness in every aspect of her, her or his life, and that includes our financial resources. Last Sunday afternoon, I drove to Betty Phillips Park in the Highland Crest neighborhood to be part of the neighborhood peace walk. Uh, several of you were there as well, and, and this event was a response to the reality of violence in our community. It, it was encouraging for me to gather with a variety of people from across Topeka to say enough is enough. The violence must stop. I don't want to see news stories anymore about violence in our community. It was an opportunity to stand up and speak out for justice, a small thing. But, but I'll confess that there was a moment uh, last Sunday afternoon when I was walking through the neighborhood and, and chanting when I thought, what will this accomplish? What difference is this actually going to make? Violence across the community, much less across our country, is such a massively complicated issue. How will this gathering on this day make a difference in moving towards peace? And you might ask yourself that in, in any number of actions that we might take that, that we say, hey, this is, this is work for justice. And I believe that it makes a difference because it is a step in the right direction. Uh, consider uh, violence in our community today. Too many, suffer, too many people suffer and die from violence, not only here in our community, but also across our country. We heard news just, uh, just uh, recently about a shooting in Odessa, Texas, and I wonder, what, why, why do people have to die from violence? Now, now imagine the future. Imagine a day in the future when our community or communities across the country would celebrate a month, a year, five years without a violent death. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? There's a gap from where we are today and where we might be in the future. And the walk last Sunday didn't get us from here to there. It didn't get us to where we might be in the future, but it was, I believe, one small step in helping to close the gap from where we are and where we might be. And our work for justice is about closing this gap on any number of issues across our community. So that what we see today and what we envision in the future, our picture of God's kingdom might become more and more so, might become more and more of a reality. This gap exists in the circumstances of any number of people groups. Imagine the current reality for refugees, for migrant workers, for homeless people, the LGBTQ community, some older adults, many single parents. Where's the gap between where we are today and where we might be? And I want to invite you to be a part of a conversation about the gaps that exist in our community and ways that we might work together for justice. You can see in your bulletin an opportunity to sign up for one of the uh, Topeka Jump House meetings. At these gatherings, you'll have a chance to talk about some of the things that you uh, share your deepest concerns about, where you see where we are today and where we might be, and say, there's a problem here. There's something that keeps me up at night, and, and we need to do something about it. You'll have the chance to share those things and help guide our work for justice in the year ahead. I invite you to join me in signing up for a date that works for you. Topeka Jump, of course, you remember, is an organization of faith communities across Shawnee County seeking justice through collective action, trying to make a difference by working together. And this is just one part of that process. It's not going to get us from where we are to where we might be, but it's one step in that direction, beginning the conversation. And you know... It will take us step after step and steps after that to begin to close the gap 
being present at, at a house meeting is one chance to take action. It's not the only way you can do it. But God does call us to take action for justice. Our actions for justice do make a difference, only even if it seems, especially perhaps if it seems small and insignificant. Our text from Psalms today offers us a source of strength to continue to take action even when the steps are small and it's difficult to see progress. The psalmist writes, My God, rescue me from the power of the wicked. Rescue me from the grip of the wrongdoer and the oppressor because you are my hope. Lord. You, Lord, are the one I've trusted since childhood. The writer of these words was facing distress, a difficult path into the future, and everything in life seemed to be in opposition to the hopes and the dreams for the future that the writer had. And yet these words speak of confidence in God, and they invite us to rely on God as we work for justice today. In the story from the gospel, according to Luke, Jesus heals a woman on the Sabbath day she was set free from her sickness. Jesus offered her justice, that, that which was due to her. Jesus heals her. Now at that moment, Jesus didn't bring healing for all people for all time, and yet it was an action in the right direction. It brought healing for her. It changed her reality. And the leader of the synagogue takes issue with Jesus' violation of Sabbath rules to heal this woman. Jesus responds by saying that we should do more for this woman than we would already do for an animal on the Sabbath day. We should do justice. Jesus' response echoes the cry for justice we see throughout scriptures. This woman should be set free from her illness. It's always more critical to free up a human being from whatever binds her or him than it is to follow the letter of the law blindly. And the crowd, those that were watching, those that were standing by, saw Jesus and the leader of the synagogue and this woman, and they rejoiced at the extraordinary things that Jesus was doing. And here we find an invitation for joy. It's an invitation to the joy that's found when we act for justice, doing the right thing, when we find that joy and justice are two sides of the same coin. When we seek justice, we find joy. And the good news is is that God gives us the power to take action for justice every day. And I imagine some time in the future where those that are paying attention would look and see there are people that are seeking justice as Susanna Wesley And they're not the only ones. There's people from across our community. And we look back at where we were years ago and we see a community that was filled with violence or people oppressed, any number of issues. And and look how far we've come. And we have the chance to live in a part of God's dream for our future, to take action for justice because God invites us to be healed ourselves, to act in our community and to find joy. Will you pray with me? God, when we look around, we confess that we see challenges that seem incredibly large, and it's overwhelming. So we ask that you give us strength to take small steps, that we might take action toward justice, that we might seek the good of our community, and we might follow you all of our days. We offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.